The European Commission highlights energy systems integration as central to the future European energy system. But what does energy system integration mean and what are the ambition benefits? What are the potential hurdles that needs to be overcome if we wish to see this at a large scale? And what policies are key uh, when thinking about implementation at different stages? These are the topics discussed in a new research report launched here today uh, at SNS. My name is Therese Lind and I'm a research director here at SNS. Today's report, titled Policies for Integrated Energy Systems, is written by Carlo Cambini. Carol is a professor of applied economics uh, at the Polytechnic University of Turin. His research has long focused on uh, energy economics and regulation. He has also worked with the Italian energy regulator and is currently an economic expert to the Italian prime minister's office. Carlo will begin this seminar uh, with a presentation. After this, we have three guests who will share their perspectives on the matters considered in the report and join us in a panel discussion. The guests I wish to welcome are Thomas Egebo, who is president and CEO of Energinet, Alf Enqvist, who is CEO of Göteborg Energi, and Emma Wiesner, who is a member of European, European Parliament and a representative of the Swedish Centre Party. I will present all of you again when it's time for you to join uh, in the panel discussion. Uh, as usual with our seminars, we encourage you in the audience to participate. So feel free to ask questions to our speakers today. You do this by sending in your questions in the box that is shown in the browser below um, your, uh, where, you, where you view the seminar, so to say. Uh, when you send these questions in, uh, my colleague Angelica will take care of them and make sure to raise them later during the seminar. Today's seminar, both uh, uh, together with the report, is part of our three-year research program here at SNS called the Energy Systems of the Future. If you wish to share what is said here today in social media, we are very happy if you would do so. Uh, please use the hashtag SNSKunska. So with that, uh, I leave the word to you, Carlo, for your presentation. Welcome. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. OK, so let's start. Uh, we all know that the energy sector is one of the responsible sector for to CO2 emissions. Uh, in the 2020, 45% of the emissions were related to the de these industries, uh, together with uh, the transport industries are the two main industries where um, CO2 emissions are larger. And of course, there is a, a new target that is important to, to obtain in terms of effort to decarbonization. Of course, uh, this seminar is also extremely time in time considering the, 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 the Glasgow meeting that ends a few days ago. Uh, the carbonization policies uh, push for the adoption of the new uh, renewable resources and distributed generation. Uh, there is some uh, projections that says that 97% of uh, the EU productions in 2050 should be made by renewable resources starting from uh, around 30% on average in Europe uh, of production uh, in 2016. So a huge increase in, uh, in, in renewable. Uh, renewable resources change dramatically their technologies. And all technologies in production of energy change quite a lot in recent years. And now the problem is that uh, is this uh, all the, 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 make the system that we have, the, we currently have, uh, is uh, um, is the correct one to deliver a climate neutral economy, uh, and to manage all different sectors, uh, the so-called the energy vector, so electricity, gas, and heating all together. Uh, the point that we need to consider is that currently those uh, different. Uh, uh, energy um, energy systems are managed in quite independently one to each other. And the point to understand is if it's are some benefits or less inefficiency in managing those uh, uh, systems uh, uh, all together. And so if you move on the next slides, this is exactly what Teresa basically said before. There is a new sort of paradigm uh, called energy system integration. In reality, there is other names 
uh, that uh, you, you can find in European documents. For example, sector coupling is the most used when we discuss about mostly the integration between energy and gas or smart energy integration. But the point is that uh, what is the energy system integration is a sort of holistic view in order to uh, uh, consider uh, this, uh, 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 the three networks that we discussed, at gas, heating, and electricity, all together. Here you can see the definition provided by European Commission. So the uh, energy system integration is the coordinated planning and operation of the energy system as a whole across multiple energy carriers, infrastructures, and consumption sectors. This is extremely important as a definition because uh, the, the, the main idea of the energy system integration is to provide a clean, secure, and reliable energy system at the lowest cost as possible and with the expected uh, highest benefits in terms of reduction of the CO2. So with a sort of climate, climate neutral approach. Of course, from the economic point of view, this, uh, the idea of this integration is particularly important because then you, it's, it's more likely to, uh, for companies to exploit economies of scope and the synergies among the different energy networks, and so and also to obtain some flexibility in, in the system with the introduction of uh, new, let's say, uh, elements, which is not completely new. I mean, uh, it's a long-term research on this, related to the ICTs, to the storage systems, uh, to the conversion technologies. So in the next slide, uh, you will see a sort of uh, a sort of different approach that we are, uh, that is uh, the picture that represents, which is, uh, which is the expected, the new approach of the European Commission is uh, pushing uh, towards, uh, forward, sorry, in the next years. So, don't, uh, let's uh, recall a bit what, where we, we come from. We come from, uh, in many European countries, in a situation where all networks are managed independently one to each other and also regulated independently one to each other. And now the point is that uh, we, we notice that um, um, there is a lot of uh, elements that we need to take into account in, in the three network that may, be, may provide some uh, benefits uh, and especially reduce the inefficiency of these uh, completely in, um, independent uh, um, operations. So, for example, here in this picture, you see that the three network, the electricity, heat, the gas network, there is a lot of uh, examples. Uh, that uh, all, all the, the CEO after can provide after my talk, but in general, for example, think about the uh, the the the, the uh, heat uh, in many industrial processes. There are some uh, uh, heat that is created and is generally wasted. What we can do with this uh, sort of uh, a holistic approach or integrated approach, you can use this uh, uh, wasted heat in order to create uh, uh, heating or to create electricity. Or for example, in many other situations, uh, you can, um, mm, for example, you can use uh, uh, power to heat solution. So you can use electricity to produce heating and electricity, for example, to recharge in the networks. Uh, for example, in the vehicles, this impose that uh, within these systems, we need to de develop uh, a uh, sophisticated uh, storage and conversion system you can find here in the just in the middle of uh, of the three network which are the, at the core of the network now in order to you know uh, save energy store energy and use energy whenever is possible and whenever is needed uh, what is important from this approach from this picture is that which is that do not uh, directly emerge from the picture is that uh, in this scenario consumer participation is a central in the sense that um, uh, today, um, even uh, atomistic, but there is a lot of uh, single consumers that become also producers of energy in the so-called distributed generation approach or the so-called prosumer uh, situation. So when they produce electricity, they are dispersed within the network, and so uh, they are extremely active uh, in, within uh, this new system. The all the, the, the all approach should be technologically neutral in the sense that as recommended by European Commission, especially by the DG competition, uh, this, there is no, no the European Commission legislation basically do not impose 
uh, any kind of technology as the best solution because the main idea is that it is the market that select the best innovative technology to be used. So this is extremely important. There is no a priori selection of what is the best one, but it's the market that themselves should encourage the adoption of a new, a new approach. If we move to the next slides, here you can see some of uh, the, the main elements of this uh, integrated approach. Of course, I will not enter too much into the details. You have the three networks, electric grid, gas uh, grids, and uh, district heating. And basically what we have here is that is the, the, the different kind of renewable resources on the blue network, and then the electric batteries, so which be, are becoming essential for the storage of electricity uh, and, uh, and, and the and the possibility, of, of course, to to have some uh, um, reserve on of, on energy along the uh, along the process. At the same time, the key point of uh, of this uh, of this approach is that um, electric batteries currently, at least, are extremely costly. They require a huge uh, capital cost, and therefore. Uh, they are extremely. Uh, there is a lot of uh, you know uh, risk also on the side of the company to adopt one solution, given the fact that as I will come back later, the technology is not yet uh, um, you know uh, there is no the standard on this technology yet. Then you have a other potential solution conversion mechanism. Uh, the power to gas, the power to heat, the power to hydrogen, the, the idea to use electricity to produce hydrogen for the, the, the new you know, evolution of, uh, the, the, of the network in the future. Uh, all these networks would be integrated uh, typically with the so-called smart ICT grids with the idea to use some ICT components in order to connect all users in the network. So both producers and, and consumers and have a, a sort of a, time-to-time uh, -time, uh, connection with a grid with a, uh, that make a, a, a constant uh, um, instantaneous uh, uh, equilibrium between the demand and supply within the market. So you see that uh, the, from uh, the economic point of view, the situation becomes a bit more complex. We have a multiple network that should be integrated with the new technologies, basically ICT technologies, in order to allow and improve uh, uh, this integration between networks. So, is there some example of this? If we move to the next slide, one of few examples that I found, in, at least in the literature, but maybe the, the next speaker will provide other examples on this, is a German project called Wind Node. It's a project that ran between 2017 and 21st in five regions plus the city of berlin uh, in the project we have 70 partners partners from uh, the from the industries and partners from uh, the public uh, public institutions the budget was not so huge i mean 66 b and millions and 30, uh, with 37 millions granted by the ministry of economic affairs and energy within a, a specific funding program in germany what was the main goal of this project the main goal was to efficiently integrate large volumes of renewable energy especially solar and wind in, while ensuring stability of the power grid and combining electricity mobility so for, for, for cars, electricity for cars, electric vehicles, and heat sectors to exploit this flexibility. Uh, all, all partners were connected through an ICT platform that coordinate all actors, so generators, consumers, grids, and the market itself. And this project goes to an end in 2001. And there was a, some, uh, a report that you can find on the web on uh, on this um, um, on the project, but where basically actors reported that the scalability of uh, this kind of project were somehow limited, in the sense that they were able to to run the project uh, thanks to the budget, the, the funds provided by the government. Otherwise, it was too costly to to pursue. But also that was some limitations in the within the current uh, uh, regulatory framework in German, at least that they do not adequately support the provision of this kind of flexibility for the company. Of course, uh, in, in, in interacting all networks means to provide to the company some flexibilities. If this flexibility is not allowed, of course, the benefits out of this integration is less likely to be developed. So moving to the next uh, 
slides what we did, uh, what I did in this project, basically uh, building on a, on a, on a, some papers that I did with some colleague, uh, and probably most of you knows uh, Torai Jamas but from Copenhagen Business School. We developed some analysis on uh, on this uh, um, uh, on the, the adoption of this technology. Try to point out mostly the so-called economic and policy barriers to the development of uh, energy system integrations. So here are some elements that we 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 discuss uh, and we I, I discuss in the report that you may want to read. Uh, I, I hope that you may want to read after after the seminar. Of course, there are some limitations in terms of the cost of the technologies. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the problem of the cost of the technologies are. Uh, uh, is a, is a typical in uh, in these industries in the sense that um, uh, uh, all new innovations are extremely costly and so require a lot of capex to be developed. Okay, thank you. So the the capex was somehow uh, typically high. For example, for electric batteries, there is some reduction in terms of the cost of capex over time. There is an expectation of a, a cost a reduction, at least in the in the technological literature, of around 40 to 50 percent in the next 20 years. But still, the, the amount of the capex is somehow uh, quite high. Of course, there are, uh, this creates also problems in terms of uh, the intrinsic risk of innovation. What's the main problem in terms of innovation? I mean, uh, it's the fact that um, as long as we develop new technologies, and as long as we develop a new uh, uh, a new functionality, functionalities of the dual networks, uh, 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 there is a, a problem of uh, uh, risk that the companies face when using one technology with respect to another one, and also risk for the for the user, for the final consumers, in, in terms of a prosumer, so in terms of distributed generation, uh, to adopt one of the other technologies. Uh, there is also a problem in terms of uh, coordination between grid users. Uh, the more distributed technology the generation we have, this is of course good, but you this also generate more transaction cost within the network and cost that uh, typically transmission operators and distributors uh, should face. So there is also always a tension between the need of consumers and the one and the benefits that uh, energy operators may obtain. Finally, access to data is also important here. There is many experimentations in, um, in, um, in some experimentation of integration between energy and gas, energy and heating, and, uh, and those ex this kind of examples create a lot of data in terms of consumption. I participate to a European project, uh, European 2020, 2000 project, where we did some field experiment here. The point is that if it's possible to share the, the knowledge obtained here and the data in order to estimate correctly if those projects are profitable or not. Uh, sometimes, for example, those data requires data uh, uh, calls for data on consumption level for consumers, and somehow this data might be protected for privacy laws, and this creates some uh, impediments for, 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 for using those informations. Uh, other elements that are important here, and I want to focus mostly on the role and organization of the regulator, uh, typically in many countries, uh, for example, in, in Italy, uh, in many other European countries, uh, networks are managed one independent one to each other. So we have regulation for energy, a regulation for gas, and regulation for district heating. But uh, the point is to try to understand if these uh, um, silos approach is correct you know it's in a world in a, where energy system integration might become more relevant and you know when the complex the, the, the system become more, much more complex than before so let's move on to the next slides in the next slide here i put some uh, potential policies to influence uh, the uh, the adoption of energy system integration uh, i don't want to enter near the table the, the one of you that might be interested can have a brief look to the to the report, uh, but I will focus on some of them. But before moving ahead with the with these the specific uh, policies, uh, it's interesting to 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 see from this table one element. If you look to the column, the, the in between column, the target stakeholder, you can see that uh, there might be a lot of different policies that uh, might affect. Uh, all different uh, actors here might be final users, general 
DSOs, aggregators, uh, and so on and so forth. So there is a huge potential effect that might be created within this market with all different actors of the energy system. So let's try now to focus before concluding on some of these uh, policies and moving to the next slides. So uh, one of the first the first points to focus on is the innovation problem by network operators. Uh, the experience in German points out that uh, many of those uh, projects basically are characterized by very high capital cost. Okay. Uh, when you have a very high capital cost, of course, uh, you have uh, two possibilities from the company perspective. A very long-term project with uh, you know, less risk and a, re a clear return, or otherwise uh, you need to make, uh, the, you, you, uh, the companies that might be incentivized to run those projects only if they receive some uh, uh, incentives. Which kind of incentives? One potential incentives that we point out and focus on in the report are the research and development grants or investments grants. So like in Germany, in Germany, they decided to provide some, of, you know, they would say bonus or, you know, grants to specific projects in order to incentivize the adoption of those projects. Other elements that might be used to uh, policies to, 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 to bridge the gap and to incentivize the energy system integration. Uh, the taxes, levies, and subsidies. Unfortunately, in many countries, and I mean, uh, uh, the Italian case is irrelevant, and uh, the electricity prices are very high, and they typically incorporate a lot of uh, additional components in their prices, especially on levies uh, and taxes. Uh, this problem is extremely relevant nowadays. We all know that uh, in many European countries, especially in this period, the price of energy has increased quite a lot, okay, due to some uh, international constraints, for example, in gas. Uh, the gas come from, from Russia, that by basically reduce supply, and this creates so a huge increase in prices. Now I put my hat of uh, the sort of, um, you know, economic advisor of the, 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 the current Italian government. Uh, the Italian government, in order to reduce and avoid an excessive burdens for Italian consumers, decided to introduce uh, a bonus of uh, around the six billions of euros uh, in order to cut the price of electricity for the next uh, two semesters. But the point is that uh, we need to make a change which is more structural. And indeed, the, the Italian government decided to introduce uh, new reforms in order to eliminate from the tariffs most of the uh, taxes and levies that characterize the, the industries. So it, this what makes what to reduce the, 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 the price of electricity to, you know, to incorporate the real cost of electricity somehow and, and facilitate the use of electricity for other use. I don't know, for creating heating, for uh, producing hydrogen, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is extremely, extremely important policies, of course, in those uh, countries where the price of electricity is somehow high uh, and where, for example, nuclear plants cannot be used. Um, another possibility is to use uh, feed-in uh, and uh, feed-in tariffs and premiums. Uh, feed-in tariff and premiums are the possibility to have, uh, for example, a price for electricity producing re with the renewable resources with a fixed price for a certain at least amount of time. And uh, the premiums are the same for the company perspective in terms of production to provide some extra returns. What's the idea of those elements? to create rooms for uh, companies to uh, uh, obtain extra revenues that might be used in order to invest in the new technologies, which, as, as we said before, might be you know, uh, more risky or less, uh, uh, less development. So these impose some risky activity in terms of uh, investments. Uh, let's move to the, to the next slides. Uh, other reforms that might be feasible are reforms from a more regulatory perspective. Uh, what I what I studied in the some uh, pilot project, for example, in Italy, is the possibility to reform the ancillary markets. What's the ancillary markets? Is a market that, that today is a re, is a limited only for uh, transmission systems operators, at least in Italy, of course. Uh, in uh, our uh, markets where you know, you can uh, commit with final users to reserve some capacity at a certain price. This creates a sort of, uh, you know, uh, the possibility to manage some capacity during the day and during, uh, the, the, during the, the, the week in order to monetize those capacity and uh, obtain further revenues. 
Um, as I said, in Italy, uh, but in most of Europe, this kind of uh, uh, po 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 potential markets is uh, uh, not allowed for distributed uh, the, the, the distributors, but on, uh, it's possible only for transmission operators. But the problem is if it might be feasible to open these markets also for DSO. Uh, finally, which is a core of my, uh, which is a part of my analysis, which is uh, particularly developed in the report, is the problem of uh, related to the uh, regulatory framework. Uh, if it's true that uh, most of these uh, technologies require a lot of uh, investments by companies, and probably this might be re the reason why the, there is not so many uh, energy system integration projects around Europe uh, in today, uh, the point is that uh, uh, probably regulation might, might change in order to favor those kind of investment. How we can do that? Well, there is a lot of different uh, possibilities here. Uh, some of them are discussed in the report. For example, from one, one, one side, we might use uh, the so-called return on capital to incentivize those investments. The return on capital or the so-called walk, so the weight average cost of capital, the, the regulators may decide, for example, to uh, give extra return on some specific kind of investments uh, in order to facilitate the adoption of those investments. Uh, might be also the, uh, the idea to use a completely different approach of regulation. For example, as the one used in the UK, uh, that move from the so-called input-based regulation to the so-called output-based regulation through the model named Rio model, revenue, innovation, incentives, uh, uh, and output model. What is, what's the main change of this uh, peculiar regulatory framework? Uh, the main change in this uh, is that uh, uh, since uh, the UK regulator recognized that some investments are particularly uh, costly and risky, uh, the idea was to in increase uh, the time span, uh, the time horizon of regulation, so the regulatory period, and increase also the remuneration for companies. Of course, this uh, calls for an increase also of the retail tariffs. And in order to avoid a, su a super uh, compensation for regulators, uh, the, sorry, for companies, the regulators introduce some market testing. So the idea to have some uh, check on the level of final Carol, price in order to avoid thank you so much the affordability. So much. You have to start to wrap up. Do you want to highlight any oh. conclusions? Yeah. Oh, of course, yes. Uh, just just to conclude, what I what I want to say in terms of regulation is simply that. Uh, uh, what might be beneficial for European Commission point of view and also for company point of view is to introduce some regulatory sandboxes. So the possibility of some uh, temporary exemption for some specific projects in order to allow those projects to emerge and to develop. The regulatory sandboxes has been used, for example, for some projects in the uh, Valer Highland in, uh, in Sweden and in many other countries for the very, very specific and small projects. So maybe regulatory sandboxes might be a solution. Thank you so much for your time. And now I leave the floor to the next speakers. Thank you so much, Carlo, for that presentation. I have a couple of follow-up questions, but I think I will save them for, for uh, later and we will move straight to the next speaker. Uh, I want to uh, invite Thomas Egebo, who is president and CEO of, of Energinet. Uh, Energinet is an independent public enterprise owned by the Danish Ministry of Cl Energy, uh, Climate and Energy. Energinet owns and operates and develops the transmission system for electricity and natural gas in uh, Denmark. So, Thomas, I am very curious to hear your uh, reflection on the report. Well, thank you, and thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I, I think, in general, it's it's a very well thought through report, uh, which focuses on uh, on relevant and interesting barriers for energy systems uh, integration. Um, and, and I also think the the overall approach to sort of efficiently uh, decarbonize through first focusing on on efficiency, then electrifying directly where possible, and and lastly substituting fossil fuels with uh, renewable alternatives through indirect electrification. I think that's very much in the line with how we see the, the needed development. Uh, but, but of course, we all know that direct electrification and indirect electrification through hydrogen 
uh, with most of the renewables coming from fluctuating wind and solar sources, that does indeed point towards a very, very complex energy system in need of massive energy systems uh, integration. So far in Denmark, we've mostly overcome the challenge of fluctuating uh, renewables by integrating across countries, uh, but now we need to integrate on a massive scale uh, across uh, energy systems. Uh, <clears throat> we, we have, of course, in Denmark, solid experience with uh, co-generation of electricity and heat, but, but I think this integration has to be taken to a whole new level, uh, creating a kind of all integrating network uh, and also with ancillary services from, from new, new sources uh, on both the supply and, and demand side to ensure the, uh, the stability of, of the systems. And I think many of the policies in the report are within the right themes. Uh, some of them are more relevant to us than others. Uh, I have to move around a little bit to turn on the light here in this, this room. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but anyway, I, I think there are many uh, relevant, uh, relevant recommendations uh, in, in, in the report. Um, one comment I have is, is, is on, on the PTX. I think PTX and hydrogen is going to be a very important part of the future. I think that the study here focuses a lot on blending hydrogen uh, in the methane grid. Uh, we, we might see actually with developments being very speedy in this area that, uh, that there are some indications of a potential large scale uh, hydrogen industry emerging both for direct use and, and also for further uh, refinement into renewable fuels. And I think that's that's going to be part of the of the future and part of the solution. So just a few things to uh, briefly say what we do at Energinet on some of these uh, issues that were, were mentioned. We, we have actually adjusted our organization by merging the systems operations of electricity and gas, merging that completely together uh, to, to, to optimize planning, to optimize uh, market developments, et cetera, across these two uh, types of, of energy because that's part of the future. We are, we are working a lot with adjusting our tariff structure to better reflect costs, etc. Uh, and and we, we do it in such a way that it, it's, it's probably going to underpin uh, large scale flexible uh, consumption sources. That's, that's also, uh, I think, a very, very, very important thing. We are working a lot on ancillary market developments, both within uh, our own country, but also across uh, countries with, with our neighboring countries. And then uh, data and digitalization, I think that's that's a very, very important area to us. Uh, I, I think uh, data and digitalization is going to be part of the future infrastructure, as it were, uh, and at least part of the glue that will you know, allow this system integration and also unleash uh, flexible demand. And it also spills into a challenge we have, which is the, let's say, the control room of the future, because the energy system is going to be so complex that we need uh, automation, we need artificial intelligence, et cetera, to, to, to basically operate the system and, and run uh, our control rooms. So, so these are some of the things that we're working on, but but I think I, I share many of, of the thoughts in uh, in the report, and and I think it was a very good presentation. Also gave there, uh, Carlo. So uh, great, thanks a lot. I think we go straight on to the next speaker, and I want to welcome Alf Enqvist. Alf, you are the CEO of uh, Göteborg Energi, an energy company which sells and distributes uh, distributes uh, electricity, district heating, natural gas, to mention a few things. Uh, Göteborg Energi is also owned by the city of Gothenburg. Uh, welcome. What were you? What were your reflections when you read the report by Carlo? Uh, thank you very much. I think I will start uh, my reflections with a picture. I think I, um, you can show a picture, uh, maybe a slide. Yes. I think it's um, on. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is, it is on. And um, uh, I will take the perspective from. Um, a city. This is a simplified um, a picture of the energy system in um, Gothenburg. And uh, you can uh, take the next slide, which maybe makes it a little bit clearer. Uh, we have a lot of uh, sector couplings uh, in, uh, in the city. Uh, the district heating system is uh, actually the core 
of the system. But as you can see, we have also coupled with electricity, we have gas and also with district cooling. And uh, uh, waste and waste recovery is also part of the system since we use waste and waste recovery to heat up the district heating. We have also coupling to the transport system with the refineries we have in the, in, in the city. And uh, uh, the recovery heat from the refineries are, are uh, warming up about 25% of the district heating uh, system. And this is kind of my, uh, one of my points is that uh, uh, when we look at, at sector couplings in, in the bit bigger uh, picture, uh, we, we shall start to see what is the possibility of sector coupling in, in uh, the smaller perspective uh, and then go the way to, to be a little bit to, to see what we can do in the bigger picture. Uh, the challenge we are in is, of course, to, to uh, radically transform the entire en energy system and at the same time handle the growth of electricity needs from industry and from transportation. And I, I think we will need, and you are, are uh, I think in your report, uh, Carl, you are reflecting that, we, we need to have a pragmatic mindset uh, to what we can do. And, and, and when we talk about policies and regulations, we, we need policies and regulations that are more general than, than specific. Because when you do couple uh, sectors together, there is a risk when you are too detailed, maybe to take part of something you think is very, this is something we have to take care of from a regulation or rules point of view. It spills over to the other sectors also. And that is what we, for instance, have seen in the uh, taxonomy uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, I think that in your report, Carl, you, you, you reflect uh, these different, uh, different problems that we have to solve. And uh, I think it's, uh, from my point of view, it's, it's a good start to see how we can also couple the, uh, the new technologies uh, uh, together. I mean, Thomas was mentioned hydrogen, for instance, and hydrogen will absolutely, together with electricity, be part of our pathway to, uh, to um, a green uh, future. Um, well, I think I, I stopped there and um, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Alf. Uh, last but not least, I have Emma here with me. Emma, you're a member of the European Parliament for Centerpartiet, the Centre Party, and the Renew Europe Group. Uh, before Emma became a member of the European Parliament, uh, she worked at, at uh, Northvolt as a public affairs manager and also an energy markets analyst at Sveco. Emma, you're also currently a member of the Advisory Council to the Swedish Energy Market Inspectorate. So a long uh, um, uh, list connected to the energy markets. Uh, what were your thoughts when you read the report? First of all, thanks for the invitation to be here and, and comment on this very timely report. I am an energy uh, engineer by training. Um, so I must say, I think this report is actually an excellent bridge between technology and policy, which is very welcome, talking about energy system integration. I think it's time to, to move from the technical level and also see how that can be translated into policies. And I think the, the report is an excellent step in bridging that. Um, when I read the report, I had one picture coming back into my mind. Um, which is the, the one you see on the slide um, showing right now, the diagram from the International Energy Agency report, uh, the net zero report by 2050. Because um, I think, uh, Carlo, what you are trying to, to um, present uh, in, in this report uh, or the, the system change that you're describing in the report also is very, very, very well reflected in the IIA net zero report. We're going from a linear energy system where we have three main energy sources, oil, gas and coal, with a specific purpose. 
moving, stepping down from that and building, bridging into this new energy system that you see on the right hand side, where we have various energy sources with various uh, practices that can be used for, for different reasons. Some will be used for the same um, same use case. Some uh, will work together, uh, some will be dependent on one another. Um, and it's a, a wide spectrum of colors uh, on the on the right hand side compared to the old traditional energy system uh, that we have today. So that was my like when reading this, I always came back to this picture like this is what we're trying to describe and what needs to be faced from a technical and and political uh, challenge. Um, I have three uh, like key takeaways. I'm, I try to be brief, uh, but based on then this, then uh, the graph stepping into the old traditional energy system, moving into the new modern energy system, I think what you um, mentioned in the report, the conclusion that the EU is very well organized in order to work with the left-hand side energy system. Um, we have traditional uh, setting setup of the organizational and institutional framework of the European Union, uh, which is very very well equipped for the left hand side, but not so much on the right hand side. That the EU institution and EU the EU itself needs to be better organized to really work cross sectorial and and more energy system integrated. That's the first one. Uh, the th the second one. Uh, was also when I read all of these barriers listed in the report, uh, working with this multicolor energy system, um, is that it's a lot of risks. The barriers are risks. And uh, when I worked in the battery industry, we used to categorize risks in, tr in three different fields, the financial risks, the techno technology risks, and the political risks. And all of the barriers listed here are is, is one, one of these. Um, and we really need to bridge policy and take policy into tackling and facing all of the three risk categories. Uh, you mentioned CapEx support and the R&D support as, as one way of tackling the financial risks. Uh, working with information systems, open and transparency on data, that's a typical way of, of tackling also technology risks. And, and also the political risks. I think that's where we need to be better uh, in the European Union to really uh, also bridge over the, the political risks and be supportive towards all of these colors. Um, I think, Alf, you mentioned a taxonomy. I think what's important is that we're not p picking our favorite colors of the rainbow, but rather being open to various colors of, of the rainbow energy system that we're going into and, and really try to support and bridge and bridge over the political risks on all of the, the colors of the spectrum. And thirdly, and I think Alf, you also mentioned, uh, touched upon this, I think um, I'm actually struck by when reading the report, how actually, um, how, how well equipped we are from a Swedish perspective, that with the district heating systems that we have, a lot of this is actually already, um, I mean, old food, gammal <laughs> skåpmat in Swedish. Uh, it's not, um, I mean, we are in some of these areas, especially heat, electricity, we're actually very well equipped and we have a lot of best practices and success stories already from the Swedish example. We had district heating going back since 1950s, 60s and 70s. So a lot of these uh, we're actually very good at, but on some of the other areas, energy storage, for example, we have a lot to learn. So I think also the toolbox uh, the regulatory measures needed, they will differ in each in, in between the regions of the member states. Some countries will, will need some best practices and some will need other um, tools and support kits. Uh, however, I think then uh, ALF and the team from Gothenburg Energy and the Swedish district heating systems, uh, they are well equipped to, to help and support uh, other regions when it comes to district heating and, and that that transition, um, whereas we need ba help from others going into power to X, for example. So those three, <laughs> the EU organization, the risk, risk minimization, and also the Swedish uh, best examples or Swedish good practices. Thank you so much, yeah. Emma, for those uh, initial reflections. Uh, and now I think uh, we will all join. So, so uh, that uh, I will ask uh, questions and whoever feels uh, uh, that they want to answer, just uh, wave your hand. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Uh, <laughs> that you are already waving, Thomas, <laughs> but uh, I guess that was for the light. So <laughs> <laughs> that was <Yeah>. light. <laughs> no, I'm, a, I'm alone in a big room. So. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> no, but I was thinking about this when when um, uh, I've heard all of your three comments and also with Carlos' presentation, that uh, it seems very mm, 
easy to talk about it on an abstract level, but what is it that you really see is necessary to take the next step and to make this part of your everyday business? Alf have already mentioned a few, but I was wondering, Thomas, if you could maybe elaborate. What are you, do you have a concrete example, uh, which is an example of these good practices as Emma uh, mm. uh, talked about? Yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, striving for this uh, sector integration that we, we're talking about here, energy systems integration. I think this is already part of, of our DNA and, and our everyday work. Uh, as as was mentioned for, for Sweden, we also have a strong tradition in Denmark with combined heat and power. So, so we already have some sector integration there. But but I, I think that the, the district heating systems could, could be used uh, even more uh, could, give, could provide even more resources for, for, for the future integrated energy systems because you can store energy in, in the uh, district heating systems, etc. Uh, I think this whole notion of storing energy is going to be very, very important going forward. We are at Energinet, of course, doing our best to to pave the way for, for a future uh, hydrogen-based uh, system as well because there, there we also see very, very important uh, uh, integrations. As I mentioned, we, we're doing a lot of work to develop our markets for ancillary services. I think this, this is maybe often overseen, but, but that's extremely important to, to, to uh, allow us to reap flexibility f uh, from, from new sources, because the future is really about flexibility, flexibility and flexibility. I mean, if we're going to base most of Europe's uh, energy production on fluctuating sources uh, such as wind and, and solar. We, we need super flexible systems. So also, I think that this we, we haven't mentioned that so much today, but I think the integration across countries, I think that's also uh, extremely important. So continue to build out infrastructure that, that uh, goes across uh, borders. I think that's very important. We. We have a lot of cross-border infrastructure in, in Denmark, so we are perhaps a, a good place, so to speak. But but if you look at Europe in general, there's a lot to be done there. And basically, I think we should also recognize that security of supply in the future is perhaps less of a country by country thing and more something that we are working on together across borders, because otherwise we won't be able to have uh, energy systems based uh, solely on uh, on green uh, energy. So, and there's also, I think, a lot to be said about our mindset, because we, we probably need a new mindset for for this to to come through. It is true that we have viewed the world uh, the world in in silos. So we've had the heating system, we had the gas, we had the electricity, etc. Uh, but we we need a, a mindset where we cooperate much more across these uh, these boundaries between uh, between sectors. That also go because now we have I'm a TSO and we have Alf is a DSO. That also goes for the TSO, DSO work, and and we also already see that in <laughs> in a kidnet. We're spending much more time cooperating with our DSOs in Denmark because, you know, to solve this, we we, we really need a super flexible system where, where where everybody works together. We're reaching out to the transport system. We we're having, uh, you know, experiments with the with the industry, etc. Could we unleash some flexibility? Uh, within you know cooling systems in the industry whatever it is so so this whole notion of working much more agile working much more across the system uh, taking calculated risks because we also need mm. to do rapid learning etc so so it's, there's a kind of um, change in mindset i think that we all need to to uh, ensure this uh, integration mm. that that we are all uh, looking for Carlo, you also highlight this relationship between TSO and DSO. Uh, why is that so important? Well, it's important because, as Thomas says, basically it's a problem of flexibility. Everything now depends on the flexibility between demand and supply. And as, lo as long as you want to, to, to favor those flexibilities, of course, you need to revise the, the institutional framework in order not to penalize companies that uh, 
calls for these flexibilities. This is the, the kind of elements that we try to point out, uh, that I try to point out in this report uh, based on the previous research that I did. So, you know, the, as long as the technology change, of course, also the regulation should change. This is the, 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 the idea. And uh, I, I'm not saying that, um, of course, we can discuss about also super top topics here that we don't want to discuss about unbundling, of course. This is a super hot topic. Uh, people from regulatory authorities might say, no, unbundling is important to guarantee competition. Of course, this is the case. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a balance here. It's a trade-off between having more competition and having more innovation here. And so we need to try to find a way for uh, do not disincentivize this kind of approach. And so this composed uh, new elements, uh, mm -hmm. extension of ancillary markets, uh, introduction of feed-in tariffs, uh, allowing of some, some specific elements with the regulatory sandboxes, for example, production of hydrogen. Okay, good, fine. Uh, uh, probably this is extremely important to, to consider. And also try to, you know, let's uh, to uh, let TSO and DSO to communicate again in order to minimize inefficiency within the network. I think this is extremely is important for the future because as Emma basically points out with this very interesting graph, the, the color in the next years will be a lot. There is a lot of kind of uh, different sources of productions and we, it's, uh, it's unlikely that we can still discuss about gas on one side, electricity on the other side, and heating on on the rest. So it's a lot of different resources and all of them are useful for the same goal, which is decarbonization. And so in this case, we need to revise the institutional framework. To conclude, I would like to also only to raise one point of Emma that I found extremely important uh, on the institutional message. Of course, uh, all solutions might differ from country to country. Uh, I, I'm an economist and I study in Toulouse where I did, did Jean Tirol uh, was a, is as a professor of economics and I was a student in, in was Jean Tirol there and uh, in these famous uh, regulatory models uh, they, they, they coined a term which is extremely important in regulation which is uh, one, si uh, one size does not fit all. So the same solution cannot be a, uh, a, the same for all companies, in this case for all countries. Solution might change in Italy, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Germany, of course, it might be different approaches. But the idea is that the, the, probably the new regulatory framework at a European level should uh, uh, allow those different mechanisms, which is somehow is are difficult to be to be adopted in every uh, national uh, by national regulators, basically. So there is, a, uh, I think, for you, Emma, to work on, right, with the uh, regulation at the EU level. How, yeah. how, w what are on top of the agenda for you in terms of that? Right. Yeah, I um, and and that also one of the the questions I would like to to bounce back to Carlo uh, <laughs> after after my intervention. Now, like, what is uh, what do you see as the key action or the key policy framework on on EU level? Because I think uh, the table three also in the report summarizes uh, the different way of, of tackling all of these risks yeah. that uh, we face or the barriers uh, that en energy system integration face. What would you see is the key one, the key element that needs to be done on, on EU level? Um, me personally, when reading this, mm. uh, I see the ETS, the emission trading scheme and pricing of carbon as, as one element. You mentioned it in the report. We need a uh, price on carbon to really make the um, the rainbow colors uh, more compatible to the old traditional fossil, um, uh, the fossil energy sources. So that's um, one important one that I bring with me, and and that's also what I what I work with uh, on a daily basis. I'm a negotiator for the Renew, Renew Europe uh, group on the ETS. Uh, so really work on the next next generation of emission trading scheme pricing on on carbon and the second one that i also that pops into my mind is the 10 e regulation um the the regulation selecting the projects of common interest so energy projects uh with cross border functions um e every second year the eu has um uh, adopts this new project of common interest list with energy projects with a specific 
cross-border uh, interest. Uh, it's, it should be more than two member states uh, which benefits from the projects. Traditionally, it's been uh, gas pipelines and um, uh, electricity nets uh, or grids. Um, but uh, now working with that region, that was one of the first things that I did stepping into European Parliament. I was starting my career as parliamentarian this February. Um, in, in, this m in March, I wrote my first amendment, and that was on the 10E regulation. Because um, when having the criteria on selecting these projects, we also need to move away from the linear thinking and going into a more various uh, energy system. Uh, where we also need to stimulate projects of common interest being new type of projects. So electrolyzers being added to the list, uh, CCS uh, equipment being added to the list. Um, and what I and my colleagues in Renew advocated for is that it can no longer be measured in this integrated energy system that Carlo is, is showing us. It cannot, the, the cross-border impact and cross-border effect can no longer be measured only by the number of countries involved, mm. the number of border crossings. Uh, because we will have, for example, on electricity, on energy storage, it can be a single installation in one country that will benefit the electricity system of, very of many countries. So, and, and the traditional way of, of working with 10E is that it's going to be pipeline from country A to country B, and that is cross-border impact. But that's not longer true for the new energy system. Uh, with this new integrated energy system, uh, an equipment can be installed in one country and then gives various um, benefits to other member states located in the surroundings. So we also need to change the regulation in the 10E to go from this linear into the more circular, integrated, uh, rainbow-colored energy system. Call it whatever you want. Uh, but that was that was one of the like the two frameworks I see see um, the most being reflected in this. But Carlo, maybe you want to add something else on on EU level. Those were the first two coming into popping into my mind: the the energy um, infrastructure and uh, uh, the ETS, the pricing. Right, Carlo. Do you have anything to add there, or? No, no, I share the view of Emma. I mean, uh, ATS are extremely important. Um, and also because uh, uh, the ATS might be linked also to tariff uh, um, restructuring, uh, energy tariff restructuring, as I said. I mean, uh, for example, in, in Italy, we use ATS uh, uh, revenues in order to reduce uh, the overall burden of the, the tariffs. But also tariff recomposition should change. I mean, uh, it's a having different countries with different co components of cost of electricity for example might be misleading if energy system integration is important it's not possible to have i don't know in italy that we put uh, a lot of uh, levels on the tariff while in france or in spain or in belgium the, the tariff is, is made by the uh, components which are completely different of course there are some flexibility that the single country should have, but based on uh, some elements that might be decided centrally by the European Commission. And finally, what might be also important um, for cross-border, uh, I share a view of cross-border uh, and, and infrastructure. It might be also interesting, for example, to have uh, some uh, European funded uh, project for, uh, for R&D. I mean, uh, with the specific projects where they, you know, some good bidding mechanism, uh, where they allocate some budget for some uh, specific project that uh, has a sp particular impact uh, for an environmental point of view, for decarbonization, for connecting different countries, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, you know, uh, dedicated to energy system integration. This might be another potential solution. Probably e e working only on the, the tariff level might be not on regulation strictly, strictly census. So, I mean, uh, in terms of a tariff might be might be too too much or ineffective because of uh, the level of the investment uh, the company should should have. So that might be another another other suggestions. Mm. Uh, I feel like we have been into the policy, like the top down discussion for now. But how about I was interesting also uh, interested also because I feel like a lot of uh, energy systems integration is about like, engaging the end use sectors or maybe they won't be called end-use sectors in the future, but uh, for now that's my vocabulary at least. Uh, but I mean, how do you get the companies, the individual firms to actually reconsider what kind of role they can take in the energy system? I was thinking, Alf, 
since you work on the ground, so to say, and how do you engage uh, the companies in your city to like, reevaluate their role and make them see the potential of uh, their new role in the energy system? I think that uh, the companies, um, yeah, well, the companies we have, for instance, in Gothenburg, which are, which are car companies, Volvo Cars, uh, SKF, and so on, companies uh, on a highly competitive market, uh, they have already seen this. And what I see now is that the the, the competitive companies are moving ahead uh, of the politicians because they really see the need for for developing to to um, more uh, green uh, uh, threshold and uh, from from uh, a compet competitive uh, point of view so um, and many of them see electrification and the use of electricity as uh, as a key and I, I think when we are moving also in Europe to the next step I mean we built uh, the the way we live uh, uh, in Europe and in the Western world today, we built it on electri electricity and uh, electrification, and we built it on fossil fuels. And now we have to take the fossil fuels away. And uh, uh, it's quite clear for me is that electrification will be very, very important. And uh, as as uh, we move forward, and also uh, when we talk about sector couplings, because uh, when we talk about electrification and the sector couplings to electrification, that will be key for the future. For instance, for for the hydrogen use, uh, but also uh, to have roles for the electrical grids. So as Emma says, when we do something in one country, it benefits for uh, also the other countries. The, the water pro uh, hydro production in, in Sweden uh, will be uh, very useful uh, when it's not uh, blowing in uh, or it's no sun in in uh, Europe uh, or it's not blowing in, in, in Denmark. So we, I think, part of it is to also build uh, and quite fast more solid uh, electrical grids that will uh, be a part of the the, uh, uh, the development also of our, our industry throughout uh, Europe because they are talking very very much about electric electrification and when I when I talk about with the companies we have uh, close to us in Gothenburg chemical uh, mechanical SQF or auto industry we talk electricity and mm. uh, electrification most of the times. Right. Emma, you wanted to... Yeah, one of my favorite sentences in, in this report is the risk adverse nature of the firms in the energy sector. And I think that is uh, one of the major challenges also, now speaking more from coming from, from the industry before joining policy. Not only policy need to change, we also need to change the behavior of the industry and the, energy, the companies in the energy G sector. Um, because there is, um, I mean, I, me just taking examples from when I was studying and, and being a student and we did all of these investment projects and did risk calculations, etc. Um, it's very evident that the energy industry and the energy sector, um, it's not very... Um, risk um, um, positive, positive towards risk. They're very like the, the uh, investment rates, the, the um, uh, year of... Um, uh, the number of years for the return of the investment uh, and all of that, the interest rate, etc. It is adjusted to the energy system to the left hand side mm. of my picture. Coming back to that, uh, it is um, based on and the, the investment decisions um, and all of the um, uh, analytical factors that the energy industry is looking at is adjusted to the old traditional way of, of seeing it. So I think that is um, a major challenge for the en energy industry itself. I mean, because they will have to go in and look into new business models, uh, going into new technologies and new innovative sectors, and also involved end users and consumers mm. in a new way, as you said. Mm. Um, and, and that is not something that the industry is, is used to. However, there are major opportunities uh, in going into, into that. And I think the more we talk about it, the more we have seminars and panels and reports highlighting it, I think uh, the more 
change we will see and i think in the swedish power market we're already seeing it quite a lot uh companies moving into new business models new strategies uh, and i think that's what we need to see cross cr on cross european level and i need to like help industry from a political perspective doing that but it also needs to come from within uh, the right. industries uh to to really grasp the potential of, of also being more decentralized and involving end users thomas uh would you agree? Are you too risk averse? <laughs> well, um, to some extent, yes. Uh, <laughs> to some extent, no, because you called it the uh, change the behavior, the traditional behavior of the industry. Uh, I, I call for, let's say, a new mindset uh, where we reach out and focus much, much more on cooperation, also with new partners that with, with parts of the the broader industry that we haven't uh, worked with uh, traditionally. So at Inaginet, what we are doing is that we, we are running many small experiments with you know parts of the industry. Uh, could we reap some flexibility from this source? Uh, how do we do it? How do we change our markets for ancillary services to make it interesting for 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 new sources of flexibility to come into these markets, etc. We we need to do a lot of small scale experiments like that to uh, to learn fast and, and from that develop uh, new market models that will allow this sector integration and also allow us to reap new sources uh, of, of flexibility so so that's our approach and 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 that's where i really see uh, data digitalization etc as, as a really key thing most of the experiments that we we are doing with parts of the industry they they always end up being based on something more or less digital um, so i think that, that that's that's really part of the future and may, maybe we also talked a little bit about regulation uh, we of course need a regulation that fits what is needed in the future and I, I think we need a regulation that recognizes data and digitalization as as part of of our infrastructure in the same way as uh, you know stations and pipes and uh, overhead uh, lines and cables etc uh, so uh, so so I, I think it's a recognition that uh, that we are many partners in this and we cannot one 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 cannot there's no single partner that can do this on their own we, we need a lot of cooperation we need a lot of sitting together we need a lot of of let's say new connections uh, around us to uh, to unleash some of these uh, potentials but i think it can be done it, it was also said before that you know countries are different etc yes they are but i think there are also similarities here i cannot think of one country may, maybe norway but <laughs> otherwise i cannot think of one country that's that that does not need a lot of unleashing flexibility resources but that's something we, we all need to work on. So, so there's also some learning uh, across countries uh, that is important here. And, and research and innovation was also mentioned. I think that's also, of course, extremely important because we need to do a lot of experimentation and, and fast learning to, to achieve this rapid transformation of our energy systems. I see that time is, is slightly running out. I want to uh, bring up... Uh, we have talked a lot about the benefits of this. Is there any risk associated to more integration with the with the energy systems, or is it only benefits to reap? Who wants to go first on that one? Carlo, maybe. Is it only positives that come out of this? Oh, well, of course, uh, the negative side of integration is related to the fact that uh, uh, you may change the organization of the industries, and so moving uh, back to more integrated industries, of course, with all the potential negative effect uh, in terms of competition. But again, don't forget that uh, we, we, in the European Union, the, the, the new, the new the, the regulatory package on, on energy basically changed the landscape. So the, now we have uh, much more competition in the market. So uh, move back to the more integrated system might not be, no, might not have the same negative effect of 30 years ago when the industry were more integrated uh, in, in the market. This is the first one. Uh, the, the second one might be that uh, we need always to uh, 
balance the benefits in terms of cost efficiency and synergies with the with the potential effect for final users in terms of uh, final prices. Uh, of course, uh, having you know benefits in terms of lower cost might not necessarily lead to lower price for final users. This is something we need to recognize. And so, if we insist to not, not to in too much, you know. Um, uh, rewards, for example, for capex, this might lead to price which is might not be affordable any longer. So mm -hmm. always, you know, you need always to have a sort of, a, you know, um, trade-off between the two. This is the the most negative effect that I see. And I leave the floor to Alf Thomas. <laughs> yeah, because I think that uh, at least historically there's been a lot of, I mean the geopolitical uh, relations has very much been shaped by energy. Will this like foster the cooperation more or w will <laughs> will nations feel like, uh, I think the pandemic has really <laughs> highlighted how uh, individualistic each country gets when it comes to a crisis situation. But will this like uh, foster further cooperation, you think? Or what is your reflection on that, Emma? Yeah, no, d definitely, I would say. I mean, this is a more collaborative uh, energy system. It's also a more energy secure energy system when energy becomes more distributed uh, and locally sourced. Uh, but of course, I mean, there are risks. We shouldn't be uh, naive. Uh, there are also risks going into this energy system. However, the old traditional energy system that we're leaving behind is much higher risks with the CO2 emissions and the big geopolitical um, challenges that, that, that also uh, brings with it so i would say of course there are risks we shouldn't be naive uh but what we're leaving behind is what's much much worse i think that is a very good note to end on emma uh carlo do you want to conclude with any remarks uh with what uh, no remarks and uh, only want to, to give my thanks to alf thomas and emma for the for the discussion and for reading the report at least the three three guys, uh, to get, uh, as well as uh, Teresa, of course, uh, has read the report, and I hope that he, everyone uh, else uh, might have a read after the seminar. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. I um, think uh, the report brings so many homeworks on so many <laughs> levels to, to all of us working in energy. So thanks for the excellent report. Thank you so much. And with that, we have to conclude today's seminar. Thank you so much, Alf, Thomas. Carlo and Emma for joining us here today. Uh, I want to encourage you all to keep a lookout on our website for upcoming releases and seminars. Uh, already tomorrow you can join in a conference on sustainable urban and rural planning. One session will be about the rapid expansion in northern Sweden, very closely <laughs> related to what we've been talking about today, as well as another session that will focus on the infrastructure needed for a fossil free vehicle fleet also very relevant for today's audience so with that thank you so much for today and i hope to see you soon again on an sns event <laughs>